Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. On this week's video, I want to review some important information regarding the upper extremities. And specifically, I want to talk to you today about some of our examination procedures that we use for the evaluation of upper extremity permanent impairments. And then I want to show you how to record your physical examination findings within the body of your QME report in such a way that your physical examination findings lead naturally into irrefutable and ironclad conclusions later on in your report when you render your uh, professional medical opinion on the diagnosis, on the permanent and stationary condition, on the permanent impairment, on the causation of the apportionment of the permanent impairment, uh, future or further medical care, and work restrictions. In other words, the philosophy of today's program is that strong physical examination procedures and strong documentation of the results of your physical examination support your conclusions later on in your report. And it's interesting because the physical examination is the exclusive domain uh, of us, of doctors. The physical examination is our exclusive domain. So part of the philosophy that I want to forward with today's program is that the physical examination portion of your QME report should be a masterpiece. It should be something of which you are extremely proud. And uh, when you finally put your signature uh, on the report and package that thing up and put a stamp on it and send it to the post office, it should be uh, a work product that represents you uh, in fine fashion. And it should be uh, perfect. It should be perfect with no typos, uh, with all measurements uh, completed, uh, all objective tests completely performed and documented. In other words, the physical examination section reflects your attention to detail as a uh, competent medical evaluator. And today, as relates to the upper extremities, I want to give you some ideas as to how you can uh, expand upon your documentation as relates to permanent impairments of the upper extremities. So we're going to spend some time today going over some uh, interesting aspects of the physical examination of the upper extremities. Now, of course, the upper extremities is a huge topic, <laughs> and we certainly don't have time to cover the entire range of uh, the physical examination of all the components of the upper extremity, but I want to point out a couple of key highlights of the upper extremity examination and uh, we'll have enough time to get into some interesting physical examination considerations related to the shoulder, uh, which will illustrate some of the principles uh, pertaining to the remainder of the up upper extremity. So uh, we're going to go right to the QME examination template and uh, review some of the physical examination procedures. And I have some uh, fabulous ideas for you today. I believe that if you implement uh, even one or two of these simple suggestions that will go a long way toward making your reports much more impressive and much more substantial and therefore uh, will lend support, credibility, and persuasion to your opinions and conclusions, whatever those opinions and conclusions may be. Okay, so let's begin today and let's go uh, right to the QME examination template. Okay, so here we are at the upper extremity physical examination template. And I just want to go over a couple of interesting principles related to the upper extremities. And uh, we'll have some time to get into the shoulder examination. And we'll illustrate some principles here that will apply uh, to the entirety of the upper extremity. And the main philosophy of this uh, program and this presentation is to show you uh, some ideas as to how to document your physical examination findings in a way that constitutes substantial medical evidence and in a way uh, that presents and portrays your physical examination as extremely precise, as extremely meticulous, as extremely detail-oriented. And basically, 
uh, as irrefutable findings. And I'm sure uh, you've probably read many um, QME reports or perhaps primary treating physician reports where the physical examination uh, was, to be blunt, uh, we could use the word weak, was weak. And since you're a doctor uh, and you're familiar with the physical examination procedures, you can tell and identify uh, a weak physical examination uh, as distinguished from an extremely thorough physical examination. And you want to portray your physical examination as extremely thorough. So let me share some ideas with you here uh, in today's presentation. So the upper extremity examination uh, begins, well, let me ask you, uh, where does the upper extremity begin in your opinion? Probably begins right immediately beyond uh, the brachial plexus. You might even argue that it includes uh, the brachial plexus. But let's just for sake of uh, today's program consider that the upper extremity begins at the uh, point in which the brachial plexus uh, converges and becomes formed into the named peripheral nerves of the upper extremity. So we're beginning uh, right beyond the distal aspect of the clavicle where the cervical spine nerve roots uh, uh, have already coalesced into cords and branches and trunks and divisions. And we're finally out into the named peripheral nerves of the upper extremity. So let's begin our examination uh, from that point forward, or that point distal, I should say. Well, the upper extremity physical exam begins with inspection. And we're just going to do a general inspection of the upper extremity. When it comes time to evaluate uh, each component of the upper extremity, we'll again do an additional and more detailed inspection of, say, the shoulder, of the elbow, of the wrist and hand. But in general, we begin our upper, upper extremity examination with a general inspection of the upper extremities. And so here in bulleted format, in bulleted format, is where you would list your findings on inspection of the upper extremities. So here's just some sample text that I've uh, uh, included here in the template just to illustrate how some findings on inspection uh, might uh, be phrased. So this uh, says here on visual inspection of the upper extremities, the arms were symmetric bilaterally in shape and size. The symptomatic right arm did not present with any notable mass, deformity, edema, redness, ecchymosis, or other abnormality. I concluded that there were no red flags for serious systemic or local condition, such as infection, tumor, inflammatory condition, or vascular disease. And of course, your findings may be phrased differently, but make sure to put it in bulleted format so that it's easy for the reader to pick up the information quickly. Okay, now the upper extremity examination then continues with the peripheral nerve examination. We're going to perform an examination now on the upper extremity neurology and in the upper extremity the neurology involves testing of the named peripheral nerves of the upper extremity. Now, this is an important point to note because I've, I've seen in the past uh, examples where doctors uh, describe the upper extremity neurologic exam, but they describe their examination findings in terms of the cervical spine nerve roots. And for the upper extremity, that actually is incorrect. We test the cervical spine nerve roots with the cervical spine examination and with the upper extremity examination, we test the named peripheral nerves of the upper extremity. Of course, that would be the axillary nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, the radial nerve, the median nerve, and the ulnar nerve. So the upper extremity peripheral nerve examination begins with testing of the reflexes. And uh, I know you know this, so we won't spend a lot of time on the, the reflexes. Simply to uh, simply, we'll just remind ourselves that the testing involves the biceps reflex, 
the extensor digitorum reflex, and the triceps reflex. And you'll notice here that I've uh, included a reference uh, to make it easy for you to remember the neurology of the biceps reflex. Biceps reflex is mediated through the musculocutaneous nerve. It's considered to be primarily uh, a C5 uh, mediated reflex. Since we're testing in the upper extremities here and we're not doing our cervical spine exam, we can delete references here to C5, although I will refer back to those in just a minute as we illustrate uh, some principles related to reflexes. So the extensor digitorum is mediated through the, re, uh, the radial nerve. The triceps reflex is also mediated through the radial nerve, although these are considered to be mediated, mediated through uh, different cervical spine nerve roots with the extensor digitorum reflecting a C6 nerve function and the triceps reflecting C7 nerve function. And you will uh, include your findings on reflex examination here in tabular format. Notice this is a table. A table is a convenient way to report findings on physical exam because it's organized and it allows the uh, reader of your report to gather large amounts of data uh, at a quick glance. So I can look right down these columns and I see normal, 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 normal. I conclude that the reflexes upper extremity reflexes were normal and I can get that information very quickly and notice how much clearer a table presents information than simply uh, writing these uh, findings in text format okay and I also want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, that when you cite each of the reflex findings for both the left upper extremity and the right upper extremity. Isn't this a compelling finding in your opinion? Isn't this much more compelling than if you were to say, to simply say uh, in your report, upper extremity reflexes were normal? Which of these two formats would you consider to be the more compelling finding? Imagine that you read a report and it simply said upper extremity reflexes were normal. Which would you consider to be more compelling? That or a demonstration of what the upper extremity reflexes actually look like on physical examination. You did the biceps, you did the triceps, you did the extensor digitorum. Isn't this much more substantial? Isn't this much more compelling? Isn't this much more meticulously documented? It is. So I recommend that you utilize a tabular format wherever possible uh, for your physical examination findings. Now, I want to go over something with you, uh, and this will be a, a review of neurology for many doctors. For others of you, uh, this will be uh, common knowledge. But I just want to remind all of us and get on the same page as to what it actually means when reflexes uh, are normal, when reflexes measure in at uh, what we refer to as plus two normal. What does that indicate? Well, if you remember uh, back to uh, Neurophysiology 101, you remember the reflex loop. Well, a lot of things have to function properly in order for reflexes to be normal. So let's just trace uh, some of these uh, structures uh, that have to function properly in order to provide for normal reflexes. And let's just refresh our memories as to what's happening. Well, with regards to the biceps reflex, normal biceps reflex indicates, number one, that the left and right, right bicep muscle spindles those specialized sensory receptors are functioning normally. It indicates that the left and right C5 sensory nerve root function is normal. It indicates that the left and right musculocutaneous nerve sensory function 
is normal. It indicates that the C5 level of spinal cord function is normal. It indicates that, okay, we're going through an autosave, so I can't highlight here. It indicates that the left and right C5 motor nerve root function is normal. It indicates that the left and right musculocutaneous nerve motor function is normal. It indicates that the left and right biceps muscle function is normal. Isn't that incredible? All the structures that have to function properly just in order to provide for normal reflexes at the biceps. Let's trace this down now for the extensor digitorum uh, reflex. Well, in the presence of normal extensor digitorum reflexes, that indicates that the left and right extensor digitorum muscle spindles, those specialized stretch receptors, those special afferent fibers that travel upwards towards the spinal cord, are functioning normally. It indicates that the left and right C6 sensory nerve root function is normal. It indicates that the left and right radial nerve sensory function is normal. It indicates that the C6 level of spinal cord function is normal. Let's, uh, let's go back. Let's do this. Okay, it indicates that the that we're at the C6 level of spinal cord function. It indicates that the left and right C6 motor nerve root function is normal. It indicates that the left and right radial motor nerve function is normal. It indicates that the left and right Stensor digitorum muscle is normal. What about the triceps reflex? Well, it indicates that the specialized muscle spindles are normal. It indicates that the C7 sensory nerve root function is normal. It indicates that the left and right radial nerve sensory function is normal. Let's highlight this different color. It indicates that the C7, oops, let's undo that. C7 level of spinal cord function is normal. It indicates that the C7 motor nerve root function is normal. It indicates that the left and right triceps muscle function is normal. Okay, so look at all the structures that have to function properly in order to uh, create normal reflexes. A lot of structures have to be functioning properly in order to have normal reflexes. Now sometimes our reflex findings contradict with our findings on motor nerve examination and on sensory nerve examination. But let me ask you, if you have an examinee who has uh, normal uh, biceps reflexes. We just indicated all of the sensory structures that have to be functioning properly. Would you consider that to be consistent? In other words, would you consider normal reflexes to be consistent with an examinee who reports diminished sensation in either of the C5 distribution, C5 sensory distribution, in other words, over the uh, axillary, a distribution of the axillary nerve over the lateral deltoid. Would you consider uh, an examinee who has normal biceps reflexes to be consistent with an examinee who complains of uh, diminished sensation in the distribution of the musculocutaneous nerve? Okay, so examinee reports of diminished sensation or uh, reduced sensation 
uh, is subjective, whereas reflex testing is completely objective. It's beyond the control of the examinee. So it's important to remember that in the presence of normal reflexes that indicates preserved and intact sensory function, it indicates preserved and intact motor function, it indicates preserved and intact spinal cord function. And this is a completely objective finding. And that's the beauty of reflex testing. Okay, so that's reflex testing. Let's go on to our sensory testing. And I want to spend a couple minutes on sensory testing as well. Now, the sensory examination consists of many procedures. And typically, we think of testing light touch. We think of testing pain. We think of testing two-point discrimination. And sometimes we also think of testing joint position sense. And uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about joint position sense in just a couple of minutes. I like joint position, ten, uh, joint position sense testing because it serves as a good uh, validity uh, maneuver for examinees who report diminished sensation, uh, either in dermatomal distributions or in the distribution of the named peripheral nerves. Now, typically, our sensory exam will simply be limited to light touch testing unless we have significant positive objective findings for diminished or absent sensations. Then we go on to testing pain, two-point discrimination, and ultimately uh, joint position sense. Now, for certain conditions of the upper extremities, two-point discrimination uh, is required, such as for uh, testing the digital nerve lesions and for testing uh, for carpal tunnel syndrome as examples. So in certain circumstances, we're always going to rely on two-point testing. In other circumstances, uh, we'll pretty much be limiting our sensory exam to testing of light touch. Okay, so let's focus uh, on simply light touch, pain, and two-point discrimination. And then I'll say a couple of words about joint position sense testing. So light touch is also known as superficial tactile sensibility. So here we give the reader of the report a couple of descriptive words uh, about each of uh, our testing procedures. So with superficial tactile sensibility, this is performed using our Semmes-Weinstein monofilaments. Typically we use a 2.83 gauge uh, monofilament. And here uh, I give some uh, explanatory statement to the uh, reader of the report what a 2.83 gauge monofilament is like because the reader of the report has no idea uh, what SEMS Weinstein monofilaments are and what the different gauges are. So this information that a 2.83 gauge monofilament is similar to a human hair uh, is extremely valuable. And I want you to picture your own uh, monofilaments and your own, <laughs> your own human hair, okay? Uh, and this gives a visual context to the findings, which we'll describe in just a moment. The pain examination, we use a Wartenberg pinwheel for the pain examination. For two-point discrimination, uh, we use an esthesiometer instrument. Uh, some doctors use a two-point discriminator or an instrument known as the disc riminator, or some doctors will use an open paper clip. I like using an instrument that has exact calibration, so the esthesiometer instrument is beautiful for that. And I provide some reference right here uh, for both myself and for the reader that normal, normal two-point discrimination is 2.4 millimeters on the fingertips, 4 to 6 millimeters on the dorsum of the fingers, 8 to 12 millimeters on the palm, and 20 to 30 millimeters on the dorsum of the hand. So you'll notice that two-point discrimination, at least as far as the AMA guides, has normative values in and around the hand. 
there are no normative values described for the brachium or the antibrachium. So for the testing of the axillary nerve and the musculocutaneous nerve, we probably won't have findings related to two-point discrimination. So you can probably omit that unless for some reason you decide to do it, in which case I leave it in here for illustrative purposes. So here, notice how the findings of the sensory exam are laid out in a fashion uh, that's very clear for the reader of the report. We provide findings for uh, sensory exam testing of the axillary nerve. We provide findings for testing of the musculocutaneous nerve. We provide findings for the radial nerve, the ulnar nerve, and also the median nerve. And notice how this is laid out. We advise the reader of the report that the examinee had normal sensation to light touch with a human hair, with a monofilament the size of a human hair, at the lateral arm and deltoid patch of the upper arm bilaterally. Now, look at the amount of information that this conveys to the reader. It conveys to the reader exactly where you tested and exactly what the findings were uh, comparing left arm to right arm. Now, is this, in your opinion, is this much more compelling simply than a statement that says sensory exam was normal? Upper extremity sensory exam was normal. Isn't this the way most QME reports are written? that the sensory exam was normal? Well, if I was uh, reading that report and assessing the uh, credibility and persuasiveness of that report, I might ask the doctor, well, what did you test? What parts of the sensory exam? Which arm? <laughs> Which, where did you test? How did you test? What do you mean the exam was normal? Where did you test? See, that statement gives you no information. Compare that with this. Normal sensation to light touch at the lateral forearm bilaterally. Normal sensation to light touch at the dorsal web space between the thumb and the index finger bilaterally. See, this is considered to be the pure patch for the radial nerve sensory function. This is the pure patch, the dorsal web space between the thumb and the index finger. You indicate to the reader that you know what the pure patches are, as described by the AMA guides. Ulnar nerve, a normal sensation to light touch at the distal ulnar aspect of the little finger bilaterally. And see, having your template set out like this reminds you, serves as a reminder to you to test the distal radial aspect of the little finger bilaterally. That way you don't have to remember the pure patches of these named uh, peripheral nerves of the upper extremity. You have it right here in your template. And then you simply fill in the finding here when you confirm that indeed sensation is normal. Okay? Now, if you do indeed find uh, some abnormal sensations, uh, on light touch testing, then you may proceed with uh, pinwheel testing, testing for pain, pain and deep pressure by testing with the sharp and dull sides uh, of the Wartenberg pinwheel. Now, in the presence of a report of diminished or absent sensation on light touch testing and on pinwheel and dull test, uh, pinwheel and dull testing, a good procedure to test for is joint position sense. Now joint position sense is another one of the sensory examinations of the upper extremity which simply relies on proper function of joint mechanoreceptors which inform the brain about the position of an extremity in space. So typically joint position sense testing is performed on the fingers. And I love this test because it's a great validity test for those examinees who report diminished or absent or even absent sensation 
uh, to both light touch and uh, pinwheel testing. Now to perform joint position sense testing, you take one of the uh, fingers of the upper extremity, you take one of the fingers and you position, you position uh, one of the uh, phalangeal joints in either flexion or in extension. And you ask the examinee to report the position of the phalanx, the phalanx as either up or down with their eyes closed, up or down with their eyes closed. And there's a specific procedure for doing this, which is beyond the scope of this program. But suffice it to say, for the purposes of this program, that in an examinee with a completely anesthetic upper extremity, a completely anesthetic upper extremity, with the eyes closed, they should be able to judge the position of the phalanx correctly approximately 50% of the time since in an anesthetic upper extremity they're simply offering a guess because they can't feel it. When they can't feel it they have to simply guess at the position. When you guess heads or tails you get heads 50% of the time, tails 50% of the time, and they should be able to correctly identify the position by randomity approximately 50% of the time. If they're getting the position of the phalanx incorrect 100% of the time, that gives you some information as to uh, the uh, function of their sensory system. Okay, so for that reason, I love joint position sense testing. Okay, so there's uh, some review of the upper extremity peripheral nerve sensory function. And then what you want to do is you want to provide the reader a summary uh, of your findings uh, with a summary statement. In other words, uh, the layperson reading your report does not know what it means to have what does not know what it means that the sensory exam was normal. What does that mean? What does that indicate? What does that suggest? What does that tell us? The layperson doesn't know. And so you have to provide some explanation for the layperson. And that summary statement could perhaps go as follows. The upper extremity peripheral nerve exam for light touch, for pain, and for two-point discrimination was normal with no reported alteration of sensitivity to either upper extremity. There was no numbness. There was no hypoesthesia. There was no hyperesthesia. And this indicates preserved and intact sensory function of the upper extremity peripheral nerves. And we pretty much knew that already on the basis of our reflex testing, but this specific sensory testing further confirms preserved and intact sensory function. Okay, and then we would round out our uh, upper extremity neurologic exam by performing our manual muscle testing. And notice again how the uh, manual muscle tests are laid out nerve by nerve along with the findings in a bulleted list. This allows the reader to uh, gather all the findings uh, basically at a glance. And it's a fabulous way to uh, document your findings in a way that's compelling. And notice that each of the uh, manual muscle tests uh, describes the test very specifically. For example, with regards to the axillary nerve, we test resisted arm abduction, which tests both the deltoid and the supraspinatus muscles and we compare those bilaterally. For the musculocutaneous nerve, we test the biceps, the brachialis, and the brachioradialis. For the radial nerve, we test the extensor carpi radialis, and all the muscles associated with each nerve are listed in your uh, findings. And isn't that much more compelling than simply saying, 
the motor exam was normal. What motor exam was normal? What, what muscles did you test? What procedures did you do? What nerves did you check? What do you mean the motor exam is normal? This is not compelling. This is not substantial. You want your physical examination findings to be irrefutable and to be a reflection of the meticulous attention to detail that you put forth in the physical examination. And this will support your conclusions later on when it comes time to provide opinions and conclusions on all of the relevant issues associated with the particular report. So it's the physical exam that lends support and credibility to your opinions and conclusions later on. And this is one way to provide compelling physical examination findings. Okay, let's move on to a couple of uh, components of the shoulder examination just to illustrate uh, some of the principles associated with the upper extremity and then uh, we'll conclude today's program. Now with regards to the shoulder and really with regards to any portion of the upper extremity and really with regards to uh, any body part that you're evaluating, it's important to know what are the permanent impairments associated with each of the body parts. And one of the secrets uh, held by some of the very best qualified medical evaluators is to know the impairments and to examine specifically for the presence or absence of the impairments. To know the impairments and to examine for the impairments. In other words, knowing the impairments guides the physical examination versus the opposite, which is performing a physical examination and then arriving at your opinions and conclusions regarding the impairments. No, the first principle of the most successful evaluators is to know the impairments and then to evaluate and examine for the impairments. So with regards to the shoulder and under the strict application of the AMA guides, here are some of the shoulder impairments. And you have those listed here at the top of the template to sort of guide the physical examination. So surgical procedures such as arthroscopy and resection of the distal clavicle, that's one of the shoulder impairments. If so, you would want to examine for that. Decreased range of motion is one of the impairments. We have physical examination procedures to evaluate for that. Decreased strength, in other words, manual muscle testing to all ranges of motion. We're going to look at that. Shoulder instability is one of the impairments of the uh, shoulder. We have physical examination maneuvers to evaluate for that. Uh, what about neurologic impairments? We have procedures to test for uh, brachial plexopathy and peripheral neuropathy that could contribute uh, to flail shoulder or shoulder instability. So in other words, we know the impairments in advance and we know that we cannot combine uh, decreased strength with shoulder instability. We know that we can combine decreased range of motion with shoulder instability. We can combine arth arthroplasty with decreased range of motion and decreased strength. We can combine decreased range of motion, decreased strength, and shoulder instability, and therefore range of motion can be universally combined. So we need to have a fabulous and compelling range of motion examination. So let's go through just a couple of principles regarding the shoulder, uh, and let's keep in the back of our mind that these principles uh, will apply to the entirety of the upper extremity uh, also. Okay, so our shoulder exam uh, begins with inspection and as I said uh, as we go through each of the upper extremity body parts we do a careful inspection uh, of that body part and we list our findings in, in bullet format and we provide uh, detailed descriptions of our inspection. And doctors, having this on your template guides your physical examination. This instructs you as the evaluator to inspect 
the clavicle, to inspect the deltoid, to inspect the deltopectoral groove, to inspect the scapula and the interscapular spine. Having this template in place guides your physical examination so that you hit every single high note and no stones are left unturned. We then go on to palpation. Same thing. We palpate the sternoclavicular joint. We palpate the clavicle. We palpate all the components of the shoulder. We then get into our range of motion maneuvers and we take the examinee first through a warm-up procedure just as is described uh, with regards to the spine. And so a beautiful warm-up procedure uh, is the aptly scratch maneuver, which takes the shoulder basically through every possible range of motion to get it loosened up, to get it uh, freed up, and to get the examinee warmed up as is required by the AMA guides. So then we, so, so then we describe our findings on uh, what the examinee does not consider to be formal examination maneuvers, but simply warm-up maneuvers, and we describe our findings uh, in this section. We then go into our shoulder range of motion maneuvers, and just a reminder uh, for shoulder range of motion, we use a long arm goniometer. In fact, uh, the uh, pictures and descriptions in the AMA guide specifically depict the use of a long arm goniometer. So notice by providing this statement here, we indicate to the reader of the report that we know, we know what the AMA guys require and we know how to do it. We do it with a long arm goniometer. And I once had a uh, rebuttal report against one of my physical examination reports wherein the rebutting doctor, <laughs> the rebutting doctor, um, said that my range of motion measurements of the upper extremity of the shoulder were invalid because they were not performed with a uh, inclinometer as is required by the AMA guides. And that was his phraseology, was not performed with an inclinometer as required by the AMA guides. And he actually put that in writing and uh, a simple glance at the uh, figures in the AMA guides clearly de depict these maneuvers being done with a long arm goniometer. So notice the tabular format of each and every motion, comparing the right upper extremity with the left upper extremity. We test extension on the right, we test extension on the left, we test abduction on the left, right, we test abduction on the left, and we put our findings for Mr. Jones in a tabular format. That way we can clearly see that when Mr. Jones has only 92 degrees of forward flexion and normal is 180 degrees, we can tell at a glance that there's some difference between our examinee and normal. And we want to use the fifth column of this table to indicate to the reader that this finding of 92 degrees represents a certain level of impairment according to the AMA guides. Now I have this table pre-filled out with just a few representative findings. For example, 170 degrees of uh, shoulder flexion represents a 1% upper extremity impairment according to figure 1640. Well, you're going to replace this now with the findings related to 92 degrees. And in order to do that quickly and accurately, it's a great idea to go ahead and put the charts right here below your table so that you can refer to those quickly. So we have 92 degrees, 180 is normal. Let's go to 92 degrees uh, of shoulder flexion. Here's our curve for shoulder flexion. 92 degrees represents, uh, let's call it 6% uh, upper extremity impairment. So here we would just say 
6%. Upper extremity impairment. And you complete the chart uh, with all of your findings. And you make no further reference to it here, but you refer to it later on uh, in your discussions of permanent impairment. So this indicates to the reader right here that according to figure 1640, 1643, and 1646, there is permanent impairment based upon these findings on physical examination. And you want to lay out your template so that you have these tools with you uh, right uh, on your template so that you can use those uh, immediately without having to go search for uh, your AMA guides uh, at a later time. Here you would provide your uh, observations on the range of motion. Uh, and here is where you want to give some description to your findings. See, it's much more compelling to provide a description along with the uh, physical measurement. Simply providing the physical measurement uh, does not give sufficient information or detail for the lay person and the reader of your report to draw uh, appropriate conclusions. So here you might say uh, something like, uh, on the movement of right shoulder abduction, he was, a he was able to bring his arm only to the level of his shoulder before report of sharp shoulder pain caused him to abort the maneuver. See, this provides descriptive information to accompany the finding of 92 degrees of range of motion. So always provide descriptive information for each, phys each positive physical examination finding and put it in a bulleted format that makes it uh, easy for the reader to uh, digest. Here we provide our findings on passive range of motion and with the shoulder and with all joints, uh, I recommend that you perform passive range of motion testing as well to determine uh, what is the cause of any lim limitations of range of motion, whether it's actually due to a joint obstruction or whether it's uh, due to other perhaps subjective factors. Uh, we then get into our orthopedic shoulder maneuvers, <clears throat> and it's important to lay out your template in a way uh, that organizes the tests by description rather than by name. Now, notice that I do have named tests here, such as Jurgensen sign, speed sign, the transverse humeral ligament sign. These are uh, industry specific names, meaning that these means these mean things to us in the industry, but to a layperson, the layperson has no idea what a speeds sign is. So organize all your tests by the tissue or structure uh, that you're testing. So you have biceps test, supraspinatus test, you have impingement tests, and you have all your tests listed by the type of test versus the name of test. And notice how thorough uh, and descriptive this testing description is. So, for example, with regards to, uh, let's say, an impingement sign of near, you would say that the, the impingement sign of near was negative for shoulder joint pain. There was no pain to interfere with the performance of the maneuver, and he was able to tolerate the maneuver. With Kennedy Hawkins sign, you would say it's negative for subacromial joint pain. There was no pain to interfere with the performance of the maneuver, and he was able to tolerate a firm downward pressure before pain made the shoulder give way. And notice how descriptive this is and how much more compelling it is than simply saying the shoulder examination was positive. What was positive? What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Or simply the shoulder exam 
was negative. If I was reading the report and it said the shoulder examination was negative, I would ask, and you would consider this to be a reasonable question, uh, what part of the shoulder exam was negative? Was the impingement signs negative? Was the shoulder instability findings negative? Was the uh, bursal test negative? What, what do you mean was negative? Give me some detail. Give me some information that answers all of the possible questions that I could have before they even come to my mind. And this type of formatting does that in a compelling fashion. Okay, here's all your shoulder stability tests. And remember that shoulder instability uh, is one of the impairments of the shoulder. So in order to uh, keep that concept fresh in your mind, it's a good idea to put the uh, text from the AMA guides immediately below your shoulder stability testing portion of your uh, report. Here's where in the... Uh, text of the AMA guides, uh, it describes all of the physical examination maneuvers such as the loading, posterior anterior drawer test, the apprehension and relocation tests, the Job's test, and all of those make sure that you perform each and every maneuver that's described by the AMA guides. And in this uh, particular template, I've even thrown in a couple of extra tests uh, such as the labral clunk test, the rockwood anterior instability test, and others, including the sulcus sign, uh, which is described right here in the AMA guides. Notice right here, the AMA guides describe the sulcus sign. So for the impairments, such as shoulder instability, it pays to have all of the information immediately available to you so you can guide your examination towards the evaluation of the presence or the absence of the permanent impairments. And this follows our general principle, which is to know the impairments and to examine for them. Okay, doctors? So uh, I think you get an idea as to how to uh, complete your examination uh, findings and then how to structure your template. Um, here is the table that you can refer to uh, quickly for the uh, instability impairments. has all the ratings uh, that you can refer to quickly. This is table 1626. And wherever possible, include descriptions of the, from the AMA guides in your template as well as the tables. Uh, as another example, uh, one of the permanent impairments for the shoulder is uh, loss of strength or weakness. So here is your shoulder strength examination template, <clears throat> which describes all of the muscles, all of the nerves for all of the motions and includes table 1635, where you can quickly refer to uh, the permanent impairments. Okay. So I think that gives you a, a good idea how to structure your examination. Let's uh, conclude today's program with just a couple of closing remarks. Okay, doctors, so let's wrap up today's program and summarize with uh, just uh, three general principles that we can extract uh, from our demonstration on physical examination and also on our template for reporting our findings of our physical examination. So pr principle number one is for you to fashion your examination procedures exactly, exactly as those examination procedures are described in the AMA guides. Now it's interesting, the AMA guides do not describe a lot of physical examination procedures. Now they do describe some, uh, but they are not exhaustive on physical examination procedures. And I can think of a few references within, within the AMA guides where they simply refer the reader to other textbooks for uh, details and information regarding physical examination procedures. So the guides are sparse on their descriptions of physical examination procedures. So therefore, it's all the more important to at least include 
those physical examination procedures that are described in the AMA guides. And you want to fashion your exam procedures and your exam protocol exactly as it's described in the AMA guides. For example, uh, just to illustrate this point, in Chapter 15, there are several references to different types of neurologic exam procedures and test procedures such as sciatic nerve stretch tests uh, and other procedures that, uh, that we use in the physical examination and that we have at our disposal uh, in the assessment of spinal impairments. And some of those are described specifically in the AMA guides. Well, I recently reviewed uh, some reports, uh, some QME reports, some final reports that were signed and dated uh, that contained errors and did not describe a physical examination procedure even remotely consistent with the AMA guides. And remember, one of the tenets of the Escobedo decision was that opinions, for opinions and conclusions to qualify as substantial medical evidence, the opinions and conclusions have to be based on an adequate history and an adequate examination. So what is an adequate examination? Well, an adequate examination begins, it begins, <laughs> it at least begins with the procedures that are described in the AMA guides. And I recently read a report uh, that had the AMA guides all mixed up and did not contain procedures uh, that are described in the AMA guides. And let me just illustrate that for you. A report where one doctor was uh, rebutting the findings uh, of another doctor. And the first doctor had created a very thorough uh, QME report with a very thorough uh, reporting of his findings. And the second doctor came along and was doing a rebuttal to controvert the opinion of the first doctor. And it was a case involving uh, L5 radiculopathy. Well, the second doctor uh, did not was not familiar with Table 15.2 of the AMA guides, and Table 15.2 is very clear in describing uh, the motor testing for the L5 nerve root. Uh, the AMA guides Table 15.2 describes testing of the extensor hallucis longus, the extensor hallucis longus. And the report that I was reviewing had descriptions of the extensor digitorum longus. Now, we know that the extensor digitorum longus are also innervated by the L5 nerve root, but the AMA guides are specific in describing the extensor hallucis longus. So the principle here is to align your physical examination procedures in accordance with what's required by the AMA guides. <laughs> Can you imagine being at deposition and being asked, well, uh, doctor, uh, what muscle did you test to assess for L5 radiculopathy? It says here in your report, uh, you tested the extensor digitorum. Can you show me where in the AMA guides it describes the extensor digitorum? And it doesn't. It clearly describes the extensor hallucis longus. And this report uh, got worse because the doctor was not uh, familiar uh, with even the nerve roots. And he ended up diagnosing uh, S1 radiculopathy all the while uh, making descriptions of weakness uh, of testing of the extensor hallucis longus. And uh, the report was so bad uh, and the doctor did not make any mention uh, and never took the time to do uh, heel walking and toe walking. And you can see here by this reference in the AMA guides on page 376, the AMA guides are clear in describing uh, heel walking and toe walking. Well, the first doctor had negative findings on both heel walking and toe walking. Those are negative findings for radiculopathy. Those are findings for good strength uh, of the anterior tibialis and the gastrocnemius muscle groups, representative of 
good function of L5 and good function of S1. And the first doctor reported uh, heel walking and toe walking, whereas the second doctor neglected to do heel walking and toe walking, but described profound weakness, plus three weakness, plus three weakness uh, of the extensor digitorum. Now, plus three weakness is consistent almost, almost, with a drop foot. It's almost consistent with a drop foot. In fact, you could make an argument that uh, it is consistent with a drop foot as the foot, uh, as the knee goes to uh, elevate and the ex uh, anterior tibialis uh, fails to resist the weight of the foot against the acceleration of gravity, it would drop into a drop foot. And so the doctor uh, was not clear on the grading system and the testing for uh, radiculopathy as is described in the AMA guides and the report uh, just simply did not qualify as substantial medical evidence. So the principle is to align your physical examination procedures exactly as those are described by the AMA guides because when it comes time to defend your report it's the AMA guides upon which you are going to want to rely. Okay, so that's principle number one. Principle number two is to describe the findings of each and every procedure that you perform. Describe your findings of each and every procedure that you perform. So in other words, don't simply say uh, the sensory exam was normal. Even worse than that, uh, the neurologic exam was normal. <laughs> the neurologic exam was normal. There are a lot of procedures that go into the neurologic examination. And just using the neurologic examination as an example, describe the findings of each and every procedure. And when the reader reads your report, the reader will conclude, oh my goodness, this doctor is extremely thorough. This doctor is extremely meticulous. This doctor is extremely painstaking in his physical exam. I'm certain that he's extremely painstaking in his opinions and conclusions. So, with regards to the upper extremity, let me just give you a couple of examples of this. So just a couple of examples of that with regards to uh, the upper extremity, uh, with regards to the shoulder. So for example, sometimes, sometimes you'll see a statement in a uh, QME report that impingement signs were negative. Impingement signs were negative. Well, that's a sum conclusory statement. Why not list out the findings of each and every impingement procedure that you perform? Why not perform several impingement procedures? You know, it's not uncommon to have one of the impingement signs be negative while the others uh, are variably positive. So describe the findings on Dauburn sign. It was, say it was negative for pain, it was negative four jump sign in the subacromial bursa, which would indicate subacromial bursitis. Say that the impingement sign of near was negative four report of shoulder joint pain. Describe how you did it and describe the findings of each and every maneuver that you perform. Sometimes you'll see uh, a statement in a report that shoulder stability tests were negative. Well, which tests were negative? How do you know they were negative? What does negative look like? Remember that the readers of our reports uh, are both lay people and sometimes doctors. So satisfy both audiences by giving uh, complete and accurate descriptions wherever possible. So for example, the anterior apprehension sign was, this is done supine. This was negative for fear of anterior shoulder dislocation. So that's a negative apprehension sign. 
the anterior relocation test was positive for relief of fear. This would be a positive relocation test. Now this is just sample text, doesn't go with a negative uh, apprehension sign. Well, let's just change this. If we had a positive apprehension sign, we could say that it was positive for fear of anterior shoulder dislocation and Mr. Jones recoiled from the maneuver. And then we have an anterior relocation test. We say that this was positive for the relief of fear, for the relief of fear. And describe, these are just examples, but describe your findings on each and every examination procedure. And then finally, pr principle number three is to explain the findings uh, for the reader and translate your findings from doctor language, doctor physical examination finding language, into language that the reader uh, of the report can understand and translate your findings and let the audience of your report know what that means. Because it's simply not enough to say uh, that, for example, uh, straight leg raise testing was negative on the left. What does that mean? What's the translation of that? What's the conclusion of that? What does that mean to you as the doctor? And what should I, as the reader of the report, what should I understand as a result of reading this physical examination finding? So let me just illustrate that uh, with one point, and then we'll conclude the program. Okay, and this is just uh, one example, but uh, you can apply this to uh, all of your uh, uh, examination findings. Let's go back to our discussion on the sensory exam. Remember that we fully elaborated all the details of the sensory exam for the axillary nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, and we did all the upper extremity peripheral nerves with regards to uh, light touch testing, with regards to pinwheel and dull testing, with regards to two-point discrimination, and we even talked about uh, joint position sense testing. So imagine that we do this, and this is way more thorough than you would uh, see routinely uh, through your review of many QME reports. But this report, uh, these findings take on special meaning when you report and translate these findings for the reader. So look at the summary statement at the end here of the sensory testing. The summary statement uh, gives the conclusion and it gives the reader uh, the translation as to what all these findings mean. So in this case, uh, the, the conclusion is that the upper extremity peripheral nerve sensory exam for light touch, for pain, for two-point discrimination was normal and there was no reported alteration of sensitivity to either upper extremity, including no numbness, there was no hypoesthesia. There was no hyperesthesia. And here's what this means. This indicates preserved and intact sensory function of the upper extremity peripheral nerves. Now, this is a conclusion that all parties can use. Defense attorneys can use this. Applicant attorneys can use this. The claims administrator can understand this. Other doctors who read this report can understand what you mean and what you're trying to convey uh, by your descriptions of these physical examination findings. The conclusion is that in your opinion, what you're saying here in great, great detail, in great detail, notice doctors, the great detail, what you're saying is, that in your opinion, based on your thorough examination, you conclude that upper extremity peripheral nerve sensory function is intact and preserved. And in this way, doctors, this physical examination finding becomes an irrefutable, irrefutable 
finding, which is exactly what you want. Okay, doctors, I hope this helps you, and I uh, hope you uh, got some uh, good points out of this presentation. Uh, really, the whole purpose of this uh, presentation is to help you ramp up the content and the quality of your physical examination and the way that you report your findings in your QME report. You know, uh, if you've read any number of QME reports other than your own, you start to get a good sense about what are the things that you do well, and you get an idea from other doctors uh, what it is that they do well and, and therefore where you are perhaps a little bit weak. And uh, that's always a good exercise uh, to review other doctors' reports because uh, you get ideas as to how other people think. And whenever you find a, a good idea in another's QME report, uh, feel free to adopt it into your own report because uh, we're all in this together and we all learn from each other. And uh, nothing new under the sun is ever uh, newly invented. It's all just uh, relearned, even though it's relearned sometimes newly by some of us. <laughs> so feel free to adopt these ideas and suggestions into your very next report. I offer these to you uh, as ways to increase the credibility, the persuasiveness, and the substantiability uh, of your QME reports, which will help uh, catapult you and catapult your reputation as one of the best evaluators in the entire state. So uh, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I want to thank you for joining me on today's video. Look forward to being with you on future videos. And for now, I'm wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.